Hey, hello friends. Thank you for joining me again today. Let me get my monitor all set up here. Anyway, hello, my name is Dan. Maybe you know that. And uh, I'm an artist. This is Daily Art Adventure number 707. Woohoo! <laughs> this should be a quick one because, well, relatively quick because I, I'm going to pack up here shortly and head downtown to do what I really love doing the most, which is painting on location in the heart of a city. And most of the time, that means my city. <laughs> Hello, Jody. And uh, <laughs> Foxhole Willie is here, so we can start now. Okay, these people right here, there's, I don't have too much to do, but I have, a, as, I, as I've looked at this painting in the last several minutes, it's like, eh, I, I like it pretty much. It's okay. It's, it's a decent painting, which is always a good feeling, but it's got a little bit of everything everywhere, so I'm just going to tackle it. Okay, I've got two fig, the two main figures, that is to say, figures are not the main thing in this painting. But, such as it is, there are two people, and they're the two main people. I have other figures back here. Anyway, I'll, uh, right now I'm thinking they're walking either that way or that way. They're going that way. That was, I just made, made up my mind right there. As you may know, I've mentioned this a couple times, uh, I do a lot of cityscapes, of course, and therefore I do a lot of cars. <laughs> And I don't necessarily do them well, but, but I am working on it. Um, and I also do a lot of pedestrians. Again, not necessarily well, but I'm working on it. <laughs> I want to say, shut up, leave me alone, I'm working on it. <laughs> but I really, I would never say anything like that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So I am always, of course, trying to get better at figures and... And everything. Cars, right? We're all trying to get better at everything, aren't we? Um, I was going to say, though, I, I, my standing procedure, process, what's the word? That's not the word. I'm, practice, practice, practice. That's what I'm looking for. Standard practice is to have people in pairs just and unless you're making a statement which is okay sometimes I remember one time I did a, a painting of inside Duke um, Chapel which is a huge you know gothic it's a little bit of Europe dropped into Durham North Carolina you know 35 miles from here um, big big beautiful gothic chapel and I did an interior. It was seven feet, whoops, the painting was seven feet tall and about two, three feet wide. Nice painting. You can still see it, I think. Now that I think about it, wait a minute. Maybe it's not there. Anyway, uh, and and uh, so it has all these pews in it, you know, and I had just one person seen from the back, just the head viewed from behind in that and, and so that created a particular ethos, a particular atmosphere because there was only one figure. So it's okay, of course, to just have one figure in your painting or, you know, one person on the sidewalk. But generally speaking, I think that that is communicating something. You're trying to get, you're trying to tell a story. Whereas if you have two people, you're not telling a story. <laughs> You're just, that's, that's sort of normal. That's people. And, and it generally, I think, gives the viewer just a sense of, oh, yeah, things are as they should be. So most of the time, that's my default setting, is for the prominent figures in a, in a cityscape is to have two people 
although here I've got a whole bunch of people back here, which I just kind of like. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe ten, nah, nine, ten, eleven. These guys are alone. So there you go. A little bit of a few loners. <laughs> just, to, just to be give the, an accurate impression of a cityscape. <laughs> um, now, all I've done just in the last few minutes is darkened each of those uh, figures a little bit, just to help give a little bit of definition, not too much, a little bit more here. And I'll come back in a minute and do define them. Again, not by painting the figures, but by painting the background behind them, so, which, as you know, I contend is a very good habit. Any, anytime you can paint something, not by painting it, but by painting around it, do that. Negative painting is far more, uh, far might be overstated, negative, but I'll finish it. Far more, it, it. Negative painting is far more intriguing and interesting than positive painting. That is to say, don't paint the object, paint. Define the object by painting the stuff around it. All right. I have stated that many times, so I won't belabor the point. Now, I have printed out, right before I started this broadcast, I printed out a couple of references for me. One is, I went back to my file on my computer and uh, printed it. Hang on. I've got a piece of paper here. cut off a bunch of the excess so that I can tape this photograph fairly close to my subject. There we go. All right, so there's a picture of the tree, the tree. Um, I don't just want to paint any old tree. By the way, that is, I'm teaching a class this November. Well, I'm actually teaching it twice. Once at Jerry's Artorama, our local art supply store here in Raleigh. And then uh, I'm teaching it again uh, at Art of the Carolinas. I just looked online a little while ago, and sorry to tell you, but the, the class at Art of the Carolinas is sold out. How to paint trees. I, I'm really looking forward to that. I, <laughs> Historically, <laughs> frankly, historically, I have I have frowned on. <sighs> forgive me for frowning. I've sort of frowned on those kinds of classes. Let me give you a more extreme example, like a class that is titled "How to Paint Birdhouses." <laughs> for instance, I don't mean you've got a birdhouse and you're painting it. I mean how to paint a picture of a birdhouse, that kind of thing. Generally, you know, that, that's an extreme example. How to paint lighthouses, or a lighthouse. Now, anyway, because generally, but anyway, I have caved in to pressure. <laughs> um, how to paint trees, I feel like, is such a, a wide need. My impression, and my impression is correct, <laughs> My, my impression is that most entry-level painters um, paint landscapes more than anything else. They paint landscapes. A little bit of still life, a little bit of figure or portrait, but most entry-level um, painters are interested in landscape. And most landscapes, I don't know if you notice this or not, it's a highly scientific researched statement. That's sarcasm. Um, most landscapes have trees in them. And yet trees are m much more challenging, it seems, than, than people tend to think. And entry level painters tend to do a much worse job <laughs> at trees than they think. Whew. <laughs> And evidently enough people agreed with me that they had signed up for my class at Art of the Carolinas. Anyway, one, so, but I'm, I'm happy to give away free information on my broadcast. 
all the time. One of the things that I would encourage uh, beginners, that's too low of a term, early journey, how about that? One of the things that I've encouraged early journey painters to do is do not paint trees out of your head. Paint specific trees. Paint that tree or this tree or that tree. Don't just paint, you know, trees because most again early journey painters they need they they need to not paint they need to fill up their their reference file and and shut down their SOS file if some of you are familiar with that term that's a term that I invented SOS stands for not help in in my art teaching world it stands for survival oriented symbols oh boy now i've done it i've opened a whole topic that i'm not sure i want to get into <laughs> okay but I've, I've gotten in i've opened it i better close that door a little bit okay um, most people no all human beings in order to survive living on this planet their eye when i say the eye i really mean their brain but the the seeing part of their eye their eye uh, is amazingly well equipped or designed to keep us alive and one of the ways our eyes do that is by doing as little work as possible in other words saving calories burning as few calories as possible by turning everything in our field of vision everything in our experience everything in our world once we've encountered it, our brain turns it into an SOS, a survival-oriented symbol. Now, when I teach my drawing class, by the way, speaking of Art of the Carolinas, that is my one class that is not sold out, and it's the one class that all, <laughs> I repeat, <laughs> emphatically, <laughs> all early journey artists, early journey painters need. They need a drawing class, not a painting class. So uh, I encourage you, if you're at all able to get to Raleigh, North Carolina in the second weekend of November for Art of the Carolinas, please do sign up for my drawing class. I, I ramble on a lot, as you know, on <laughs> here on my broadcasts about painting. I really rarely ramble about something even more important than painting that is drawing so uh, if you want to get the scoop most again most early journey painters they don't really need painting classes they need drawing classes and in this class and I'm gonna because it's a, a high dollar event out of the Carolinas the classes are not cheap therefore I at least I presume many others I pull out all the stops. I will have handouts and outlines and visual aids and really work on my presentation to give you the best possible. I'm, I'm calling it, this is gonna be the best drawing class I've ever done. So if you, if you would like to sign up for that, please do so. There's still a lot of empty seats in that class. I think sometimes people resist drawing classes because drawing just isn't as sexy in their mind as painting they want to paint they want to paint and yet in order to be a good painter you really need to draw and most of your mistakes early journey people most of your mistakes are drawing mistakes so one of the rules is you don't just paint you know trees that's out of your SOS file, your file cabinet, I call it, that every human being has in that filing cabinet are stick figures and houses that are square with a triangle on top and so on and so forth. You, you know the type. A sun in your SOS file, the sun is a quarter circle with lines coming. All, this, all the ways that you drew when you were in third grade, that's, those are your SOS, or actually up until third grade, those are your SOS files. I have another word for the SOS file, and it's SSSOS file. 
you know, SS, yeah, SSSOS file, which is super simple survival oriented symbols. That's what's in your, that's what populates your visual mind until you replace the SSSOSs <laughs> with real studied images. And by studying is, I mean, you look at a real thing. Like you look at a tree and you copy that tree. Now, by the way, I'm not copying my tree down here, but I am. I did draw several things out of that photograph to put up here. All right, I'm going to leave dark stuff behind now for just a minute. I don't mean dark topics <laughs> or dark mood. <laughs> um, but uh, dark paint. I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth here. Um, we have a little thing pressing need here. Um, there's a sidewalk. There's a, a little, one of those, um, about a 12 inch high iron fence. I guess you'd call it a fence. Um, railing. I'm not sure. Um, right along the edge of this park, this this park, and if, if you can you can go back if you missed it and watch me uh, start this painting on location downtown in downtown Raleigh last Wednesday, I believe. So I don't know which daily art adventure it was, but it was it was plein air painting in a park is probably what it was called. Anyway, there's a little fence down here. fence yeah a little iron thing so that's what that's what these lines are let me zoom in so you guys can see a little bit better here and then there's sidewalk on the other side of the fence and then beyond the sidewalk of course is the street so one of the things here I've got is it looks like this car is parked on the sidewalk and that's because some of the tire marks come below this line right here so the I have several little things I need to fix here. Not the least of which is the sidewalk, of course, being cement or concrete is a, is supposed to be a, a lighter, brighter color, a lighter shade, lighter value than the um, street beyond. So uh, I need a little demarcation and of course here, I'm getting the opportunity to negative paint, reverse paint, negative paint the iron fence. Again, I don't know, what do you call an iron fence <laughs> that is only, um, that is only 12 inches tall? Barrier, I'm not sure. There, just like that, I pushed that car off the sidewalk. Isn't that a relief? Didn't hurt my back or anything. <laughs> yeah, well, just a little bit of definition here makes a big difference. I decided when I was downtown, when I started this painting last week, I'm almost looking at these buildings straight on, but not quite. If you will, this is straight on, but these I'm looking to my right. So I actually included linear perspective so these lines, do I have a T-square here? No, but I might have a, uh, just a triangle square, I if I do. Uh, looking for a larger one. Ah, sorry. I'm make, making more trouble for myself than I anticipated, but let, let me just show you for a second. And honestly, uh, after doing it, after I got home with this painting, I said, I'm not sure that was the right decision. Sometimes if you follow, three-point perspective too carefully, you can get yourself in trouble. And this might be one of those times. So I'm trying to create a T-square here. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, come on. 
not stay. Oh boy, I'm pushing. Let's let's. This is not working as well as I would have thought. All right, that's pretty pretty. Ah, <laughs> pretty close. Oh my goodness. My point is, do you see this line? It it it's not level, right? It goes down. Um, likewise, this one, and then likewise the sidewalk is supposed to go up and indeed it does all right now my point part of my point is here i decided to do a three point pers three point perspective i'm sorry this way okay so there's a vanishing point about 10 feet off the end of this canvas and it's pretty accurate i mean the sidewalk goes up and the tops of these buildings go down and all these lines go down right you, so like this. Can you see how I'm, I'm exaggerating it now? But that's the perspective. The problem is sometimes when it's so close to horizontal, you just cause visual confusion. And, and uh, it's too late now. I'm not going to change it. But after I got home, I thought, not sure I should have done that. I, I, I wonder if I should have just done it straight on. So sometimes, that's a good example, sometimes your analytical mind can get in the way of good painting. Uh, I'm not sure that I should have done that. I, I, anyway, but it's done. I'm going to leave it. It's still mildly, uh, not disturbing, but anyway. I think if I had to do it again, I wouldn't. I would just do it straight on because it's just too close. And... Uh, was it Susan who sent me a, I've mentioned it a couple times, an excellent YouTube video uh, on, I, I might, if I can find it, I'll post it again because it was very good. The uh, teacher talked about something, I think he called it perceptive perspective. That might not have been the word, but that was the concept. Um, and, and I've never heard anybody else, so to speak, talk about that or label it but it's something that I've been aware of for years. So I was glad to hear somebody else describe it and give it a name. There are times when literal, uh, accurate three-point perspective is not your friend. There are times when, when you need to do, if you will, the impression of three-point perspective. That's all I'm going to say about that, <laughs> at least for now. I'm doing a hint of flesh tone right now. That concept, by the way, of um, sometimes sort of academic analytical accurate thinking really can get in in the way of of your painting overthinking because the, the so what's this what is the better way the answer is we actually actually always paint with our eyes our eyes trump everything and you have to be careful not to get sucked up, sucked into too much analysis if, if the vision is still not correct. And I, I just gave you an example of that right here. I think my, my three-point perspective, so to speak, is, is pretty accurate. But that doesn't mean that I should have gone with it. I maybe should have not been quite so analytical and just to make it flat. All right? But I'm not going to change it now. Close enough. The fact that it's probably accurate helps a, a little bit. That's, that's better than inaccurate. Back to my practice I, I mentioned the other day when I was working on this window about the, the 
highly repeated or repetitive or repetitious motif. There's, if there's any, and it happens in architecture a lot. If there's any shape line uh, uh, that is repeated several times in a painting, like in this case, the, the mullions they're called, the mullions in the windows, um, then you, you need to come up with several different techniques for rendering that repetition. Otherwise, your painting looks dull, boring, repetitious. So I just I've done some with some with a brush, some with a palette knife, some um, with negative painting, painting the dark in between the light. And that's just me scribbling. It, originally, I had the lights like this. I had the lights on in these two windows, and then upon further reflection. I changed my mind. All right, gonna leave that for now. Let's go somewhere else. I, I quite like the the energy in all of these walls. Let me show you the photograph that I'm again. It's essentially the the one that I'm working from there. Okay. Evening. It started out as a late afternoon painting, early early evening, ended up as a mid evening, <laughs> I guess I'd say. <laughs> it got dark. It got the painting got darker, and that that's a dangerous thing. You know, you don't want to follow the light. You don't want to start a painting thinking it's one time a day, and then as the light changes in front of you, you what I call chase the light. You you change the light. You, you don't want to do that generally. Uh, but with this painting, um, I knew that was a distinct possibility from the very beginning. So I, I, re I let myself um, remain uncommitted. I didn't make any value lighting commitments until later in the evening. And as I suspected, the, the scene got better and better. Again, reflected somewhat in this photograph. The scene got better and better as the sun went down. All right, but I was going to say I'm quite happy with these walls, except, but I like the energy in them. I like all the surprising stuff, the, the purple, and this is a brown brick building, but it's got green and purple and yellow and red and orange in it. I like that, same thing. This is a greenish building, but it's got orange and kind of a, a cranberry color and yellow and so forth. I like it, but... In my opinion, it's just a little bit too much of a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing, but it's a little bit too much of a good thing. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to start with this the green building over here. In reality, this building does have a again a slightly green cast to it, um, and I like the way I've treated it but there's just a little bit too much energy. So that's an easy fix. Being very conservative or gentle, cautious, I'm going to apply little bits of translucent, in this case, green, local color, the actual color of the building on top of some of that energy. Now, Given the choice, of course, I'd rather have too much energy than too little. So I'm, I want to be conservative here. I don't want to cover up all the beautiful stuff that's happening, most of which was accidental, by the way. Do you understand that? It wasn't like all pre-planned. Uh, the way that I paint is I create a lot of intentional accidents. Bob Ross's best line is happy little accidents. Um, so I, I, I paint in such a way that happy accidents are sure to happen, but it's not like I think ahead of time, ooh, I bet some little fuchsia, reddish, purplish would look good right there. No, no, no I don't think that. I just take a big brush and go, Poof! so that, so that um, as I said, so that little accidents like that will happen. But as I said, it's a little bit too much energy, in my opinion. So I'm 
painting with a kind of a dull green. No. Right down here is some of the worst area. It doesn't it doesn't read it, it hardly reads like a wall because it's so messed up. But I don't want that shade of green, that darkness of green, or that brightness of green down there. So let me mix up a darker, duller green. So I'm going to my my favorite color killer color. Did, did, you, did you catch that? Color killer color. A, a color of paint, a tube of paint. My favorite color killer tube is raw umber, which in most manufacturers, very counterintuitively, raw umber is usually darker than burnt umber. The opposite of what you would think. Usually you think if something's burnt, it gets, it gets darker. But in, in umber, it's usually the other way around. Not, not in every manufacturer, so you have to check me in that. And again, since I've mentioned this many times before, but I'll say it again, I, um, in this case, I prefer a student grade raw umber, which frankly I think is kind of hilarious. <laughs> that, that a student grade serves me better than a high quality. And I, I think the reason is because uh, with the student grade, the, the pigment content is low. That's one of the chief characteristics of the difference between good and cheap paint is how much pigment is in it. So student grade usually means low pigment. And in my case, uh, raw umber low pigment actually serves me better because I don't have to be quite as picky uh, when I'm when I'm dipping my brush in the raw umber. I don't have to be real careful not to get too much. I can just kind of take a, a mad <laughs> a mad swipe at the at my pile of uh, raw umber and it's good enough. You do not have to do that like I do, but I'm just telling you what, what works for me. All right, I think I think that's better. I can't see you're defining that window, the window ledge, the window sill even, not by painting the window sill, but by painting up to it, painting around it. That's that's another example of what I call negative painting. Painting not the object, but painting around the object. I'm going to do the same thing with this person. Defining this person by, in a sense, carving, carving into that figure. Does that make sense? That's what it feels like. It feels like carving. And I don't know if this is another person here or not. I think I'm going to leave that just vague enough that we won't be able to help. Now I have a problem here and it's been a problem all the way along. <laughs> and that is that I've got this dark, looks like a telephone pole, but it runs into these two traffic signs, parking signs or something like that. And I just made, I just made the problem even worse. So, I can't have that, so hang on just a minute. I'm going to remove some of the green that I just put on there. Let me pick up a clean brush and do some dark. Uh, this is not a good thing to have. Um, these are like convergent objects. They're, they're, con they're on top of each other. Generally, I'm, I'm going to leave it, I think. No, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to erase the, the light part down here. So now it looks like signs fastened to the post. There we go. That makes it work. That makes it work. See, most problems, you can wiggle out of one way or the other. <laughs> I 
Oh, you guys are chatting up a storm and I'm completely missing you. Hello, Fox. I said hi to Jody, Fox O' Willie. Hello, Warren Moses. Good to have you around. Oh, good. I'm glad the camera's working today. Hello, Susan. Good to have you back. <laughs> Standard ordinary scenes. That's good. That could mean that. Hello, Karen. <laughs> yes, a lot of SSSOSs. Beach Life. Welcome. That's a new name to me. I'm glad you're here. A longtime follower, but Miss my Oh, good. Glad to have you on board for the live one. Oh, yeah, Warren, that's a good idea. I should call that instead of a, a railing. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> I knew there was a better name than fence. Yeah, an iron railing, just about one foot off the ground over, uh, off the yeah off the ground over there. Thank you. Railing is the word I was looking for. <laughs> kind of dumb. <huh? laughs> Don't bother me. I'm painting. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. <laughs> Jody, I'm glad that, I'm glad you like this. <laughs> yes, Susan. Yeah, whose idea was that? Let's have a little 12 inch high fence so that people can trip over it in the dark after they've drunk a little bit too much across the street. <laughs> yeah, that's the ticket. I agree with you. <laughs> what, what design committee? Maybe it was a committee. Maybe it was that was the problem. Design by committee. Anyway, this is our brand new, newly fixed up, <laughs> newly refurbished Moore Square Park in, in the heart of downtown Raleigh. And I, I, <laughs> I, already, I already joked with the other day. It cost, it took them two and a half years. It's been all boarded up for two and a half years. Thirteen and a half million dollars. <laughs> some of us, I'm not, we're not going to start anything big, but some of us are wondering what? For that thirteen million dollars, they changed grass into grass, sidewalks into sidewalks, and trees into trees. Well, there's a bunch of trees like this, so you know, thank goodness they didn't they didn't cut down <laughs> these hundred, two hundred year old oak trees. They did not do that, but they didn't do very much anyway. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> it's still nice. It's a nice park. I just I would not have thought thirteen million dollars worth. Anyway, yes, but they decided to put this little trip railing down there. <laughs> Maybe they thought, I know, people are gonna go into all these bars and drink too much. And we want to keep those people from driving. So we'll put up a little trip rail <laughs> so that on the way to their car, they'll fall down, bloody their nose, get called by an ambulance to go to the hospital, and that'll keep them from driving. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> is, that, is that the plan? Is that what they thought? That's the ticket. <laughs> kind of like a Barney, Barney Fife mentality. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, I'm my my street now. Finally, I'm gonna do a little bit of work on the street and define the the trip rail. <laughs> a little bit more by painting around it again whenever possible try to define objects not by painting the objects but by painting around them whenever possible and by the way that that of course that whole practice is is standard operating procedure for watercolor painters right that's what watercolor real watercolor painters they have to they're doing that all the time I'm always amazed <laughs> when I encounter a beginner painter, and here I, I, I am talking not about you guys, but about a real beginner. <laughs> when I encounter a beginner painter and, and they take up watercolor painting, 
I always wonder why. Why do beginners so of, so often they take up watercolor painting? I, and I'm, it's okay; for, they can do whatever they want. But I usually like to point it. You, you realize you're starting out with the hardest <laughs> medium, right? <laughs> then some of them graduate to acrylics, and then I still want to say, you understand that oils are a lot easier than acrylics, right? And they still don't believe me. Anyway. <laughs> I didn't do my first oil painting. I, I don't know if you've heard me share this before. I mean, other than when I was a kid, my dad was an oil painter, so I played around with his paints. Oh, he gave me some of my own, you know, when I was 12 years old or something. But other than that, I, I didn't really do any oil painting. Uh, essentially, till I was in my mid 40s. Yeah, 45 years old, I think. I remember, honestly, it, it was so recently, that's only 20 years ago, yuck, yuck. <laughs> I remember being surprised at how sticky oil painting, oil paint was. It's like, wow, that's going to take some getting used to, I thought. But I guess I got used to it pretty quickly. But yeah, as a watercolorist, it just, they seem really sticky to me. They don't seem sticky anymore, I'm quite used to it. But um, why was I telling you that? Um, oh yeah, I know what it was. I was going to say when, when I did my really my first oil painting, which of course were just little practice study things. Other than the fact that paint was sticky, <laughs> other than that, I was astounded that oil painting was so easy. It's like <laughs> it felt like why didn't anybody ever tell me oil painting is the easiest medium in the world. And that's what scaredy cats, not scaredy cats, scaredy cat. <laughs> that's even worse than a, that's even worse than being a scaredy cat, being a scaredy cat. <laughs> scaredy cat painters that, that don't want to paint with oils because they're afraid of the word oil. And they think that acrylics are easier because water comes out of the tap. That's why a lot of people start with acrylics. But anyway, they don't know that, again, they're, they're doing a lot harder than it needs to be. I do something easy, do oil painting. So I'm an oil painter, not because I'm a show off, because I'm a lazy. <laughs> uh, there's only a grain of truth there. As I like to say, a raisin of truth inside a watermelon of folly. A lot of things, a lot of things in life are like that. Yeah, there's a grain of truth in there. Yeah, but it's inside a, you know, a bucket of folly. If you stick with grain of sand. Anyway, it's too early in the day to start getting philosophical, so I'll just let that just stop right there. <laughs> I also printed off, right before I started this broadcast, I printed off a uh, image of some of the cars that were parked and or driving, driving by there the other night, just in case I want some good reference, which usually I do. Again, generally speaking, same thing as with the tree. People in the early stages of their art journey, you do not want to paint, you know, cars. You know, you want to paint specific cars. Take a picture, get a picture, download a picture, whatever it is, and paint this or that car. Don't don't paint, you know, cars. Do you know what I mean by that? Just like you know, don't paint like Bob Ross. Don't paint, you know, mountains. No, paint this or that mountain. That's, that's how you get better at drawing. It's not by painting out of your head. Again, we've talked about that quite a bit. This notion that beginners have that painting out of your head is like some big achievement. It is not. It's the very opposite of that. Painting out of your head is lazy. Mentally lazy. That's why it's so easy to do. And as I like to joke, 
using, of course, analogous language, but if you paint out of your head, your head shrinks. <laughs> of course, I don't mean that literally. Duh. <laughs> but if you paint out of your head, your head shrinks. Stuff coming out of your head, therefore your head gets smaller. And again, I do not mean that literally, but there, it is figuratively, it is true. Um, when you draw or paint out of your head, what you don't realize, until it's too late, what you don't realize early on is that you're actually painting the same tree or the same 10 trees even over and over, the same 10 cars over and over and a redundancy and boring, not, not believable. Again, I've, in, even in recent years, I've come to think that that is one of the things that has separated even me from the masters that I admire, is they have studied things, the object, has studied them more carefully and longer sometimes than I have. And, and I look at their stuff and say, oh, you know what, I should pay closer attention to what cars look like, what trees look like, what iron railing looks like. I should pay more attention to what human figures, to what building, everything, 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 everything. I should pay more attention. Now, that does not translate into a fastidious hyper-realism. Again, one of my new heroes is Christian Hook, that one of you introduced me to. Look him up. Crazy. One of those young men that kind of makes you sick. <laughs> At least if somebody's that good, they should have the decency to be as old as Richard Schmidt. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. At least you're old. <laughs> Don't do this Christian hook thing in you know, crash the party at age 30 or whatever. He, I don't know, he's 40-something now, but... <laughs> and this is nothing but sour grapes and envy talking, right? In case you wondered, you just sound like you're a little bitter there, Mr. Dan. Well, yours, heck, right! <laughs> uh, but no. Um, not, honestly, okay, not honestly, no, not really. Um, um, I, I, I love, and I mean this absolutely seriously, I love people to be better than me. Love people to be better than me. In fact, let me let, me let you in a little, little, I know I've shared this before, but not very often. I'll tell you how, how what really happens inside my heart, head, mind, soul, psyche, whichever one of those words you prefer. You know, when I'm out in the world somewhere and, or online or, and somebody says, ooh, so-and-so is an artist, or, or they'll tell me the name of some artist that they just love. It can come many, any kind of, but it's like, oh, and that, and time to time to go look up a new artist, uh, somebody I've never heard of before. <laughs> now this is true confession, so don't hold me to this. I'll deny everything. <laughs> I heard you say once, and I'll say no. -uh. <laughs> um, so as I grab my phone, say the most typical way of researching some artist you've never heard heard of. As I'm looking them up, or if I'm walking into a gallery or a studio or something, somebody says, oh man, this person, they're a great artist. The dark side of me, yes, I do have a dark side. We all do. I try to stomp that sucker down, <laughs> but somehow, sometimes the, the dark side raises its ugly head. The dark side of me is saying, oh man, I hope they're not better than me. <laughs> And the English major inside me says, you're so stupid, it's I. Hope they're not better than I. <laughs> okay, got that out of the way. Anyway, so I'm thinking, man, I hope they're not better than I am. 
and then I pull up their stuff or I open the door to the gallery or the studio, whatever it is, and get this. If in fact they're not all that good, the real side of me then kicks in and I feel bad. <laughs> I, I, I would rather open the door, so to speak, and discover that somebody is better than I am. Even though there's that nasty little whisper that says, ooh, I hope they're not better than me. But my true self, <laughs> which always kicks in, whew, thank goodness, the true self always kicks in and go, oh darn, I wish they were better than me. And my inner grammarian says, you mean better than I? And I say, shut up. <laughs> Um, you and I, we are all changed and challenged and Im we improve by lifting each other up. I, I do, I know this is some of you I can't wrap your mind around this, but I, I, I this is where I live. I seriously, it sounds Sounds like I'm being funny or something, but nope, I'm not funny at all. I seriously want every artist on the planet to be way, way, way better than they are. Because we all go up together, we all go down together. Um, now, planet, that's a big place. But you can break it down into, into small size pieces. Um, and if you're a thinking person, which I'm assuming most of you are, of course, you, we, we, all. We have to wonder, I mean, name a few things. Uh, now, I've never been to Florence yet. I can't wait till my first trip to Florence, Italy. Um, but you must, if you're a thinking person, you have to ask yourself, what in the heck happened in Florence in the 15, what, 14, 15, 1600s, I think 1500s, maybe it's the heyday, I'm not sure. Need to go brush up on my Florentine history. What in the heck happened? Why were there so many amazing artists all converge in the same place at the same time, so to speak? And and one of the answers to that question is is again speaking overly generally, is because we all go up together, we all go down together. Um, why is it that the Russian artists under the communist Soviet regime were collectively, abysmally, hilariously, clownishly bad artists. And yet Russian artists as a whole throughout history are quite the opposite. They're like jaw-droppingly good artists. Well, they all went up together and they all went down together. Anyway, that's, I'm, I'm going to stop that it's um but that is i i am absolutely serious why do i want people to get why do i want everybody watching me to get better because we are because you if you get better you make me better i mean literally i get better by looking at artists work who's better than mine and it's a collective you know rising tide floats all boats kind of kind of thing crazy and I, I can't even explain that really I, I just know it's true but I don't I'm not gonna try to explain it but. <laughs> hello uncle 60 <laughs> uh, okay let me I'm missing a bunch of chats let's back up here <laughs> oh, yeah. uh. <laughs> Um, Susan said, two people walking there on the sidewalk closer to us, and that's why they look so tall, that they should be more in focus. These, oh yes, yes, yes. No, they're not, they are not in focus yet. Um, you are correct. They are the right height. If you, you know, human beings, adults, are about that much taller than cars. The cars are different height, of course, sports cars and SUVs and so on. 
Uh, but no, they, they, I, have, I am going to put cl uh, color on their clothing eventually. That will give them some definition. Good question, Susan. <laughs> Mr. Rogers painting. <laughs> it's good. I should start putting on a cardigan sweater. <laughs> and singing. Oh, y'all would love that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I did not inherit the singing voice that my daughter did. <laughs> my wife and I both sing, and we, we sing harmony a lot. You know, we're both musicians, so we sing harmony. But, you know, we don't have that timbre that everybody clamors. We don't have that clamor timbre. Clamor timbre is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, that our daughter does. When when she starts singing, everybody just kind of stops. Eyes get big, jaw drops open, and they go, golly, I could listen to this for the rest of my life. That's pretty true. And that that is how people respond to our daughter. Unfortunately, we did not get that gift. We did not inherit that from our daughter. <laughs> anyway, so I'm not about to start singing. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Do -do 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 -do. Won't you be mine? <laughs> That's enough, right? That's enough. You've already had enough. That's me not trying. <laughs> and you're not going to get me trying either. All right. I was reading some of your comments. and <laughs> Testing my... <laughs> Susan says, I can't paint on my head. Sadly, nothing there. Yuck, yuck, yuck. I don't believe that for a minute, but yeah, good. Don't paint on your head anyway. <sighs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Cadmium, cadmium red in the acrylics. Yeah, not, not good for you. All right, where am I? And I think I, I'm, I'm rambling. Not only am I rambling in my words, I'm rambling in my painting today. So I think I will, I will, I'm not going to let you watch this to the bitter end. <laughs> I'll stop here at some point. <laughs> Jerry's Arts Aroma. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle 60. <laughs> they were such great artists because they had Jerry's Arts Aroma. <laughs> That's good. I'll pass that on and pretend it's mine. Pretend it's my joke. Okay. Um, how long? Should I put a skirt on this woman? I don't know about that. But, um, yeah, here's another person with a hint of red. <laughs> Uncle 60, I thought you were going to give us a real answer to why Florentine art flourished. <laughs> uh, Jody makes a good point. Jody makes a good point, it, like about being therapeutic to paint from the heart. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm, so I'm, you're right, good, let's back up. I'm being a little bit harsh. There is a place and a time. Um, I guess I just feel like warning, you know, early journey painters not to make a life of painting out of your heart because, because your head shrinks. Um, when you're drawing or painting and copying a real thing, your brain is hard at work. And that's why we don't like it, because it's hard work. It's like, oh, man. It's a lot easier just to paint. So, yes, for therapy's sake, and occasionally, absolutely, nothing wrong with. Thanks for bringing, bringing me back into a, a more balanced place there, Jody. You're, you're exactly correct, and nothing wrong with that. But if you want to be a good artist painter, you, know, you, you make a habit of, of working at your art. Painting out of your head is fun. And by the way, I've, I, um, when I was a young man, I, sp I wasted, I s <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Frittered away, that's not the word I'm looking for, but that'll do. I um, wasted much of my youthful skill and energy by drawing cartoons. <laughs> Why? Because cartoons are easy. 
<laughs> I was and I I was surprised when I became an art major in a, as a junior in college. I switched from being a music major to an art major when I was 20 years old. And I was astounded to learn that not all artists um, did cartoons. I, I just assumed that all artists were like me. And when they were in a lazy mood, which I was most of the time, <laughs> being a human being, um, that they did cartoons, but I d discovered quickly, it's like, what? You mean you don't do cartoons? No, really? <laughs> uh, so, um, and then when I was, a, for many years, a freelance illustrator, some of my main work was as a cartoonist. I said before, 30 years ago, I was slightly known around the country as a cartoonist isn't that 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 seems funny to me now of course and it's funny that funny cartoons are funny and my cartoons are truly are funny and at least i think they are um if you want to see some of my cartoons oh yes they're available you know dannelsonart.com click on illustrations and then click on cartoons and you can see hundreds of examples of my cartoon work it's still kind of fun for me and still pretty lazy. Having still carefully guarded that lazy streak inside my soul. <laughs> All work and no play, you know. I did not enjoy doing cute, cutesy, like children's cartoons. That was not my forte at all. But for years I said, I'll, you know, I'd roll my eyes and say, I'll do cute if you pay me. And then lo and behold, late in my illustration career, late in my cartooning career, my most regular cartoon client <laughs> was Kidsville News. And it was sickeningly cute. <laughs> I probably have some of those around here somewhere. Um, I'm walking over here. Can I put my hands on a... I need, some of you need to see this. You do, you do. Trust me, you need to see this. Kidsville Oh, I don't have any color stuff here. Again, you can look at it in my uh, on my website. Okay, so I, this is as close as I've ever come to doing a comic strip. These were called so Truman is is the name of the mascot he's a dragon that i of course developed and i won't even start reading these but these are can you see that isn't that cute so cute little kids see cute little kids and now i did actually i did enjoy these because i think they're funny <laughs> of course you know don't ask don't ask me if they're funny <laughs> And I don't own any of these because I did them as work for hire. So I cannot publish my own. Anyway, I have scores, not hundreds, but I have scores of things. So that, that's Truman. And cute, cute, cute. But okay, funny too. Not just cute, funny. Anyway, that was some of my late... Sorry, <laughs> I'm reading one of my cartoons. <laughs> I haven't seen it in 15 years. That, that's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, anyway, there. You just never know what's going to happen on my broadcast, do you? Um, I, I've been working on those figures a little bit. Uh, they're not done when I put the color on them, by the way. Um, Typically, the very last thing that I'll do on figures like this is negative paint them. Duh. Surprise? No. Good. Um, but uh, as, is, as is often the case, um, if there is a, a prominent, a most prominent female figure in the painting, then I'll put her in red. 
I'm not sure why. There's not any secret message. It's just, I think it's a, just a visual, artistic. I think the, I think the female of the species is the zenith, the climax, the, the ultimate of the species. That is why artistically throughout the ages, the, the female figure has been the, the predominant, the go-to. Male too, less so in our culture than, than in years previous, but anyway, so the, the female is the primary and the red is, is a color that attracts itself, that, that attracts attention to itself, I mean to say. And again, if I put the female in red, I'll very typically put the male, put a male in blue. I've got a dull purple here on my brushes. And put some, so I've got all these people back here that need, right now they're just black, or not black, but they're dark silhouettes, blobs. And um, if I put a little bit of color on them, they take on much more corporeal, much more uh, presence. For a number of years, I used to leave all my people virtually as silhouettes. Don't know why I thought that was a good idea. Boy, have I grown out of that in the last five or six years or more. All right, I'm gonna tackle one more thing, I think, before I go. And that is, I wanna tackle this building, this wall, the face of that building. I already did this one and I think I'm done, at least for now. And again, I like the energy, so I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit more. I like the energy in this wall, but it's a little bit too much of a good thing. It's not quite, mm, holding the illusion of, plane, P-L-A-N-E, of a plane, quite as much as I would like. Now, I do, let me point out quickly, I very much do like the fact that it goes from light to dark. Um, in fact, I've made some of you, this would be a good time to repeat that, any of you who are ever going to paint uh, landscapes with, with a building or a flat plane in it, okay, whether that's the... <laughs> Um, half dome in Yosemite or whether it's the, the, what I was doing a couple weeks ago, uh, a caboose sitting at the end of the, whatever, a flat plane, typically a building, all right? Here's what I want you to do, because I'm being facetious, of course. I shouldn't tell you I'm facetious before I tell you what I'm going to tell you. All right, hold up your right hand, <laughs> put your left hand on something <laughs> sacred, your heart or your, your paint palette if it's nearby, and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. <laughs> and why you have to do this with a Massachusetts accent, I haven't got the foggiest idea. But to do it right, you do. I do solemnly swear that I will never again paint a flat plane that is not bisected by a shadow, usually cast at an angle. All right, did you get that? Let me repeat it. I do solemnly swear. <laughs> this will make you a better artist. I do solemnly swear that I will never again, again paint like a, a side of a building. And why am I making you do this? Because this is what I have done. I will never paint the side of a building again that is not bisected by a strong single shadow, usually at an angle. Now, this and that's what I'm doing here. The building goes from light to dark, shadow, usually at an angle. So right now, it's kind of obscured by this tree. And I'm gonna work on that a little bit, by the way. Now, of course, I'm being fac almost facetious, except, except that I'm serious. <laughs> almost facetious, but I really mean it. Um, oh, I just filed away the other day 
um, oh, I put it on my website too. I just put on my website actually, dannelsonart.com, click on paintings, go to watercolors, and in there is a painting of a caboose. Now the caboose happens to be a very particular caboose that sits in downtown Washington, North Carolina. So anybody, that's ever, any locals who've ever been to Washington, you know exactly of which I speak. Charming little town on the Pamico River. Beautiful waterfront and stones throw from waterfront is their, their civic center, their official building. And sitting in front of their official conference center building is this old caboose. So you, you know the kind of thing, you, you see this kind of thing, not infrequently. I presume in many places around the world. Sometimes it's a train engine. In this case, it's a train caboose. Anyway, so it's a painting of that. And I've, I've painted that a couple times, but I did it a couple weeks ago as, as a demonstration in a watercolor class that I was teaching at Cheap Joe's up in Boone, North Carolina. And for no reason at all, but, but because I'm smart now, smarter than I used to be, inside I said, I do solemnly swear. <laughs> So I took the caboose and I did a shadow at an angle, boom, right across the middle of the caboose. In fact, later I thought, you know, I probably should have moved. It's too close to the middle, but be that as it may, it's, it's I think, very simple, very, very simple. I, I did this watercolor sketch in probably 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And it, I think it's the most effective um, rendering of this, this caboose that I've ever done. And I've done it at least two other times. And what made the difference was that shadow. All right, so are you with me? I do. So there you go. I do solemnly swear. <laughs> in a, I think I think it's JFK that I'm hearing in the back of my voice. <laughs> Just to show you how old I am. Um, I mean, I was a little kid when he was killed. But, you know, I remember seeing the tapes. But I think for some reason, maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's Bobby. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I'd be I'll never, but you got the idea? Okay, see this building is more effective because it's dark and it's light. Still looks like a flat building. Nobody, I, I, I'm convinced nobody would say, wait a minute, why is that building, you know, part of it's close and part of it's hard? No, that your eye sees that, your eye resolves that easily. Um, this building, it, there, it's dark down here, but it's covered up so much by the tree I, and it's dark over here, I can't, you know, should have put a line there, maybe, but no, I'm not going to. This will take care of it in this painting. Get it? There you go. So right, that right there was possibly worth the price of admission. How much did you guys pay to get in here anyway? Well, Uncle 60, you don't count. Uncle 60 does pay on a regular basis, and I appreciate it. And also, I got a payment from Jason just yesterday on PayPal. Thank you, Jason. And uh, the rest of you, if you feel so inspired to follow suit, please do so. I'll keep doing it whether you pay me or not, but it's more fun if you do. <laughs> anyway, how much did you pay to get in here? The answer is, of course, nothing. But that little tip right there about painting flat planes in a landscape, most often a building. Um, All right, I still, I have worked, a little bit of work to do here, here, cars, up here, everywhere. I've got work to do everywhere and some down here, but I'm tired of doing it with your company. <laughs> the truth finally comes out. Oh, he does get tired of us. Not really, I'm, I'm just, I'm just tired. Um, <laughs> okay, let me, let's have fun and look at your um, <laughs> chats before I go. And I do hope to do another broadcast um, later this afternoon. <laughs> you guys, you do get vociferous after a while, don't you? <laughs> um, oh, Jody, uh, Susan comes back and says, more therapeutic, oh, how about that? I'm not good to hear. I'm glad, to th thank you, Susan, for chip ch chiming in and let us know it's more therapeutic for you to look and, and draw. Beach life, good to have you speaking up again. It's true when you get a trailblazer, you get other people that are inspired by it, so everyone gets better. Good word, exactly. 
Uncle 60 is a blessed degree in all that sense. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> a short skirt and a long jacket on that woman. That's a long, that's a song, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a country song, is it? <laughs> Yeah, exactly, Uncle. You can go on and on and on with this. It's not just in art, it's in music. It's like, why are Jamaicans such outrageously good sprinters? Because we all go up, we all go down. Why are so many, a ridiculous number of baseball players from Puerto Rico? That's crazy. Same reason, we all go up, we all go down. Anyway, so let's all go up. <laughs> oh, Uncle 60, good, good point. He asks, did I scumble? The thought crossed my mind. I, I thought, hmm, am I going to have to explain how this is not scumbling? Um, almost, almost, good eye. You, 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 that's a good question. Let me zoom in here for a minute. Um, but no, I don't think I did. The difference between scumbling and real painting is, first of all, scumbling is essentially a dry brush and you're rubbing, rubbing, rubbing. Real painting is, you to be overly technical, you leave identifiable or seeable brush strokes. So even though I was painting translucent, which is like scumbling, it wasn't scumbling because they're definitive strokes. You can see, and I, and I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but it, it's easy to see brush strokes. And those are pleasant. Scumbling obfuscates, uh, covers up, hides, diminishes, scrubs out brush strokes. That's why it's unpleasant. So very good question. Um, and I think, I think that's my answer. No, that is my answer. And I think it's a good one. Uh, but it, that was a very good question because it was close to scumbling, but not quite. Thanks for picking up on that. It shows you're paying attention. Appreciate that. Hello, Sharon London. Good to have you on board again. Thank you for the compliment. Susan, uh, I'll, I'll pick before I go, I'll pick you up one more time and let you see the painting up close. Susan said, if my kids move back to New Bern, I want to see one of your paintings in person. Oh, sweet. Glad. Susan, thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> Foxhole Willie says, I was an egg when JFK was killed. Well, half of me was anyway. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> Barbara Rudolph. Okay, good. There we go. See? I go, hope she's not better than me. I'm being silly. And then when I look her up, if she's not better than me, I go, oh, darn. I hope she is better than me. And it's not about being better. You know that. I'm being, you know what I mean? That, but, you know, I'm going to trust you. That you know what I mean? It's not a competition. <laughs> Susan. Thank you. Susan paid as well. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> and Foxhole Willie. <laughs> is allergic to country songs. That's hilarious. I used to be too, and then I took pills, and got drank of six. Nah, never mind. I didn't. I didn't actually hate beer, but but it sounded like a good joke, and it wasn't. So never mind. I'll leave it. Um, usually I say I took pills and got over it. But okay, this this woman's head needs a, just a little bit of work, and and maybe more than that. How about putting her hand down there? Anyway, I'm going to paint by myself for a little while, although it's already 3 o'clock, and I hope to be heading downtown pretty close to within an hour. I have no idea where I'm going to go, uh, just downtown somewhere. Whoops. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hang on. <laughs> How do you like this? Nice shot of my office, huh? We can hear him talking, but we don't know where he is. <laughs> a fella's got to have his private moments, you know? <laughs> You're still not facing the right way. There. All right. <laughs> uh, I am close. I, I don't want to overdo anything here because it's close, you know, it's close enough to being done and I'm in the danger zone of doing too much. But I want to indicate just a tiny bit, I'm sorry, let me back up. I want to indicate a tiny bit of plants down here. There were these low ground cover green leaves kind of shafts sticking out, or oh, just a hint of that. Maybe a little more sparkle in the cars, literally sparkle, reflection, kind of like, like I have 
a little bit here and here. And carry that out a little bit. Reflection off the windows. Anyway, I, th I think the painting is hanging together pretty well. And I don't want to spend really much more time on it. So um, I'll finish. Let me see if you get a better view. Uh, in some ways it's better, in some ways it's not. So there you go. But I, I am glad for you to see the texture up close because I know you really, really can't see it. How close can I get anyway? Okay, that's about it. You're about five inches from the canvas at that point. I sort of like the bark of my tree. I might touch it a little bit, but maybe not. Might just let it go. And the branches up here need work. I, I did some dark stuff. I have not come back and do light, done light stuff. Whew. All right. That guy can ramble on forever. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> that's why. That's why only 200 people watch my 300 watch my videos. Poor me, because I'm a rambler. <laughs> we used to drive a rambler. Anyway, no, never mind. I won't go there. All right, bye, you guys. <laughs> Hope to see you later. Bye. -bye.